always, is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So, Tim, how was your Easter? You know, it was very nice. It was nice to have a, a relaxing few days. My Easter dinner that I made, which was a um, pork roast with um, French bones in, was a hit, easy to make, and it was a very good presentation on the plate. I got a beautiful rabbit cake with white chocolate from Whole Foods. That was also uh, that was also a hit. But it was a nice, relaxing few days. And the best part of it is, it seems like spring is finally here. How was your uh, Easter? Well, I had a very quiet Easter as well. Um, Just stayed home, didn't go anywhere. And uh, it's nice to enjoy the sun for once. But let's transition on to Governor Newsom's spring vacation. So it looks like he's on this whirlwind tour. He hit Florida, his favorite state. So what are you reading about that in Sacramento? Well, normally you think you would go to Florida for spring break, but Gavin Newsom is going to Florida for a political roadshow. So we talked about how recently his state of the state address was swapped out for a political roadshow around the state where he was touting some of his initiatives on homelessness and uh, criminal justice and such. Well, after that, he announced uh, a, quote, Campaign for Democracy, which was a a political, um, I guess it's a PAC that he started. And he um, took $10 million of his campaign money that was left over from 2022 and put it in this this fund. That's kind of to pay for his travel and political efforts. And he decided to, you know, mount a political roadshow. And so he went to Texas, he was going to Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and then also Florida. And Theoretically, it's to call out red state governors that are doing things that he finds offensive. Uh, But really, it's Gavin Newsom lecturing to all of the people in these states and saying, you know, you don't value freedom in your state, which is really rich when you look at Gavin Newsom's um, continual efforts to take away the freedom of Californians in so many aspects of their lives. You know, remember during the campaign, um, he ran his reelection ads, not in California, but in Florida. And he uh, banding about, you know, the slogan, freedom is under attack in your state. I think most Floridians would say, uh, look in the mirror, Governor. Uh, Certainly all the speculation of this is that this is kind of his presidential announcement tour in waiting, um, you know, that he, you know, sees a void for not not that he's going to run against President Biden. He's not, but that he kind of sees a void in Democratic leadership taking on, you know, popular and effective red state governors. You know, we'll, we'll see what the response will be down the road, but it certainly kind of adds to the the thinking, notwithstanding his public protestations that, you know, Newsom is certainly organizing a presidential campaign in waiting uh, whenever it the opportunity arrives in 2024 or 2028. Well, Tim, I thought that Newsom, I I thought that his presidential ambitions would probably have to be delayed to future time. But today I just read that President Biden is once again, boy, he's got terrible polls. Several new polls came out that even his own party doesn't want him to run. So there's a lot of speculation. And I think Newsom sees a window widening more and more. Well, and I think he wants to be ready. You know, if there is an opening, you know, $10 million is nothing to sneeze at. I I, I think that this is definitely all about laying the groundwork for potential. And if there is an open seat, you wouldn't be doing work like this if you were going to if you weren't going to go gangbusters to take advantage of an opening. And, and, And that's what this is all about photo ops and connection making in in all of these states, because even though they're red states, there's a lot of delegates that are awarded in these states, too, for the Democrat. So, you know, I don't know if he knows something that we don't know. Um, Everybody that I've read, smart political people in the know, there's no doubt that Biden is running for reelection, you know, unless the doctors tell him otherwise. Uh, But um, which is ironic, because I think he really could be bloodied up if a, a real Democrat file to challenge him in the primaries. There's no doubt there's a lot of angst, not only nationally among voters, but among Democrats. And, um, you know, Newsom is certainly trying to tap into that angst with his roadshow. 
So our podcast this week is actually a fellow podcaster, Spencer Clavin, who is a host on the terrific podcast, The American Mind. So we have Spencer on because he has a new book, How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. So why the ancients? Well, Spencer has a PhD from Oxford in the classics and lectured at Oxford before joining the Claremont Institute. And he's now associate editor of the of the Claremont Review of Books. Now, I met Spencer through Charles Kessler, husband of our fearless leader, Sally Pipes. And the three of us went to watch Star Wars. And afterwards, we had an incredibly intellectual conversation about Star Wars. So there aren't too many people in my mind who can talk about Luke Skywalker and Plato in the same breath. And so I think people are really going to enjoy this interview. That's right. You know, when I when you proposed the idea of having Spencer on, my eyes kind of glazed over <laughs> what you were talking you know, when we talked about, you know, what we'd be, be discussing, but he has a great way of taking, you know, kind of the ancient thinkers and, and, and the classical way of looking at the world and making it very relatable to kind of what we're going through today and how we should approach the world and how we should think of things and and, and kind of what what's the best course to chart going forward. So I, I, I think even if you're not um, a big Plato fan, uh, or, or or don't have a, a big classics tome on your on your nightstand reading. Uh, I think you'll be very interested in what Spencer has to say as well. And yes, he is the son of Andrew Clavin. If you are wondering, listeners. So, a quick commercial before we move on to to Spencer. Just hot off the press, uh, the invitations are not even back yet from the printer. So, our guest speaker for PRI Southern California Gala this year is. Is going to be Art Laffer. So Dr. Laffer, as everyone knows, popularized the Laffer curve. He was an economic advisor to, to President Ronald Reagan, as well as Donald Trump. You know, Art Laffer is a tremendous speaker, the quintessential happy warrior. And no matter the odds, Dr. Laffer is always optimistic and hopeful. And we could all use a bit of that now. So uh, and it should be a fun gala. Uh, so uh, you can go to our website, pacificresearch.org, and you'll see the uh, the event box there and, uh, you know, get your tickets before they are they are sold out. I think it's going to be a fun evening as always. He is a great dinner speaker. And so you're going to learn a lot and be entertained. Yes. And that's May 11th at Orange County in Costa Mesa, the Costa Mesa Weston. Thanks so much, everyone. And here's Spencer Clavin. Spencer, welcome to Next Round. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So you've got a new book out, How to Save the West, and you present five crises threatening to end Western culture. So what are they? I'm going to start to answer that question, I think, by just defining the word crisis as I'm using it in this book, because it's got to be one of our most overused words. You wake up every day and the newspaper delivers some other crisis that has emerged. The supply chain crisis, there's a crisis of, uh, in the economy. I mean, you can name list five, I'm sure, that are happening today as we speak. Um, and it's not that those events might not be significant or serious or important. They, they often are. But when I'm talking about a crisis, I'm really hearkening back back here to the root of the word, which is from Greek. Um, in, in Greek, the verb krino means I judge or I make a decision. And so a crisis or a crisis is a decision point between two fundamentally irreconcilable, unreconcilable ways of, of looking at the world. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about five crises. I think that, you know, the one of the things that has made our politics and our news so maddening and unsettling recently is that uh, many of the developments we're up against, especially our technological developments, are kind of throwing us back on these fundamental first order questions, questions that require real, you know, philosophical thought that goes underneath the news cycle, under, under the skin of just what's happening in the moment. And so the, the first crisis that I'm talking about in this book is the crisis of reality, which is comes first because you have to think about it first. It's the crisis of absolute truth, right? Is that it's just, you know, your truth and, and my truth and nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so? Or is there such a thing as truth? that we can actually approach together through rational debate and, and argumentation. So I'm arguing in the book that, that there is such a thing as truth and that this is you know a core insight of the Western philosophical tradition. If we let it go, things fall apart very quickly. Um, and that kind of leads on to the second crisis, which is the crisis, I call it the crisis of the body. Um, another very ancient problem that we've come up against uh, a lot in the history of the West. And that is, okay, so there are these eternal truths, there are these absolutes, things that are good, whether we you know 
vote them down or not. Um, and yet we live in this world of impermanence and we live in these bodies that, you know, tend to that do always break down and ultimately die. And and so what do we do with ourselves as human beings in in the world? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, events in the news cycle right now that are kind of pointing toward our deep discomfort with being human beings in bodies. I would say the transgender uh, explosion uh, at the moment was would be the, the key example of this. Um, but there's there's other stuff too. This, these technological proposals to kind of upload our lives to the cloud and um, just get get away from our bodies altogether. So that's the second crisis is what's the point of, of having bodies at all? And I'm drawing on the kind of Aristotelian tradition to argue that our our bodies, our, our uh, life in physical space space together are essential uh, to to who we are and to everything that's that's good about us. And this kind of now transitions, the book moves then from, from these kind of maybe first order questions um, to two related crises that are kind of about the big picture. The first one is the crisis of meaning, and the second is the crisis of religion. And they're both about whether there's anything beyond the here and now, beyond materialism, beyond uh, physical science, uh, because I think there's kind of a, a scientistic, if you like, there's, there's sort of a, a scientistic argument out there that every good answer to every important question is answered by scientific experiment. And if you trust the science, capital S, you'll always get the right answer and you'll never have to do politics again. And, and what I argue in the book is that that idea, that series of ideas is really falling apart. It's not serving people well. Uh, and that the longer tradition of the Western canon can help us find a fuller understanding, not only of, of science itself, but also of our higher purpose beyond just the physical world. That's the crisis of me meaning and religion. And then finally, after uh, some perhaps rather abstract and you know high order questions, the crisis of the regime, which is the fifth one, comes back down to hard you know, nuts and bolts uh, political questions. What's going to happen to America? What's this country supposed to look like? I argue that there is a very persistent and radical strain of argument that the whole idea of America is sort of false or imaginary or, uh, in, in fact, evil and deceitful. Um, and I draw instead on the traditions of the founders and uh, the history of ancient political theory to argue that, no, a republic is an, an important and good thing. It's the, actually the best political insight that's emerged yet out of Western political philosophy. And it's it's worth preserving. Um, and we ought to do some thinking about, about how to do that. And so those are the crises. And each one is presented in the book as kind of a, a, a longstanding philosophical question that has uh, answers for us in the here and now to move forward into the future. So you touched on a little bit when talking about the, the crisis of the body, but how do we see some of the other five crises playing out in the news recently? Yeah, well, the whole premise of this book, I think it's important to say is, you know, that the, that the past has something to say to to the present. And that's not necessarily uh, an obvious or, uh, you know, universally agreed upon thing to say at this point. In fact, if you go out and say, I've written a book about Western civilization, uh, you'll often get an answer, something to the effect of either what's that, or isn't that that kind of nasty backwards evil thing that uh, we sort of threw out with the scientific revolution. Um, and so the point of talking in terms of the Western canon at all is to say that no, actually, when we come up against kind of extreme problems in the news and the daily sort of toss and churn of, of politics. Um, we're not just coming up against something that happened five minutes ago. We're actually coming up against profound questions that have been around for as long as human beings have been thinking. And the good news about that is that we're not alone. We don't actually have to go on what, you know, Dr. Fauci or the CDC says tomorrow. Um, we have a, a longer tradition of thinking about these these questions. So the, to just take just the crisis of of reality, you know, um, <laughs> we talked a lot in 2016. There was a lot of talk in the media about, quote unquote, fake news, right? Post-truth politics. And it was sort of amusing to, to read people talking about that as if it were something that had only happened when bad orange man got elected. You know, it was only the Trumpian hype men who had introduced into our politics this crisis of, of knowing what's true or false. Um, when, of course, this basic question, you know, how what, is there anything true and how can we know, um, has been around in American politics for decades. I mean, think about, you know, Bill Clinton. It depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. Um, but more fundamentally, you know, calling into question whether there's such a thing as absolute truth um, is a kind of a, a central problem of, you know, post-19th century modern Western philosophy 
philosophy. And it's Friedrich Nietzsche who really identifies it when he says God is dead and we have killed him. Um, and so there's an example of something that, you know, we're actually struggling with a much deeper problem that requires answers from further back in the tradition, something richer uh, than just, you know, wringing your hands about post-truth politics, talking instead about, say, the Socratic tradition of, of how we can know and advance toward truth. So there's one. Um, I'll give just one more and, you know, maybe we can touch on others as we go. Um, but, you know, in the sort of transgender crisis, crisis of the body section, um, transgenderism is something that we talk about all the time now. And it's very easy to get fixated on that one part of the of the issue. Um, but actually, if you dig a little deeper into that, you'll realize that there's a whole vanguard of kind of technological, uh, you might want to call them gurus, technocrats, um, who are going yet further down the quote unquote trans road into proposing that actually humanity itself is sort of outdated and needs to be outstripped and surpassed. And, and so I think that a lot of what we saw during COVID when there were these suggestions that it was OK kind of not to be physically in presence with one another, to upload everything about our lives to the cloud. A lot of that is based on a kind of fundamentally anti-human, anti-body idea that this this thing that we are, this kind of useless flesh of ours needs to be jettisoned and, and stripped aside. Uh, and so once you understand that you're up against that, I think you can have better answers to that uh, accusation and, and you can find saner ways ways of moving forward, like by saying, no, actually, our bodies aren't a mistake. They're not an accident. They're not to be moved beyond or, or jettisoned or reconfigured at will. Um, there's something essential about who who we are. And in order to be healthy and sane as we move forward, um, we, ought to, we ought to recognize that. So, Spencer, you assert that ancient thinkers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, reveal the solutions to these crises. So why should we listen to authors from thousands, hundreds of years ago when facing problems today? Well, I really would love to think about this quote from a paleontologist named G.G. G. Simpson, um, who said something to the effect of, you know, all the good answers to all the big questions were effectively discovered after Charles Darwin, and everything else is useless and we should scrap it entirely. And uh, Charles Dawkins, uh, you know, quotes this, or excuse me, Richard Dawkins quotes this uh, idea approvingly in his book, the, the Selfish Gene. And I think it perfectly reflects an attitude that many of our chattering classes regularly endorse that basically science has rendered everything else obsolete. And before that, mankind was in a kind of stone age, you know, gibbering at the sky and practicing superstitious magic. Now, this is an attitude which can only be sustained by never actually cracking open the old books that you shrug off and 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 disregard. Um, because the truth of the matter is that although science has given us a lot of great answers to a lot of important questions about how the physical world works, um, it's really singularly ill-equipped to deal with a lot of other stuff to do with, you know, human flourishing, with virtue, with love, with desire, with basically everything that makes life worthwhile. We saw a great example of this recently when uh, an American city proposed I, I, uh, to replace trees with little clear glass boxes of, I think it was algae. And this was basically going to be a substitute for trees because it would produce the right amount of oxygen, let's say. Now, there's an example of what it looks like to think about the world in purely mechanistic material terms. And it's obvious to any observer that that's deeply, profoundly unsatisfying. I think we're seeing how unsatisfying it is in the way that people are crying out for something more, uh, investing themselves in politics in this almost religious way. Um, and, and so actually, it turns out that even even though we've made a lot of advances in the last several hundred years, um, there are questions that we're wrestling with that go far, far deeper than what physical science materialism can answer. And for that, you don't just need the latest information. You also need wisdom. You need a tradition of literature and connection to the past. Um, and throwing that out simply because it doesn't conform to your moral expectations is not only a profoundly arrogant, but a profoundly lonely thing to do. It leaves you on your own uh, up against the wilderness of the universe. And I think that people are really suffering from being deprived of that connection to the past, that communion of, of great minds that comes from thinking about uh, these kind of old dead guys, if you like. So obviously, um, 
folks who are in the academic world are confronted with these crises and the debates over them probably on a daily basis, but everyday folks are facing these sorts of issues as well. So what are um, some practical steps that you suggest that regular folks can take to deal with these crises when they confront them in their everyday lives? Well, I have a glib version of this answer, but it's only partially glib because once I say it, I'm going to expand it out into a slightly larger set of suggestions for people. Um, my glib version is log off and go to church. <laughs> and the reason I say those two things is because I think when we tend to ask these sorts of questions, start to say, well, the world really seems to be going kind of poorly. There are all sorts of problems, dysfunction in my community. And there are all sorts of narratives that link that dysfunction to apocalyptic concerns about the end of America, the end of the West and so forth. Um, we immediately start to feel paralyzed and hopeless. And we feel that way because we don't actually have the power to muscle the wheel of history back into place. You know, there's we, we start to ask ourselves, well, how can I write the law that's going to fix everything? And how can I, you know, cast the one vote that's going to, you know, resolve these problems? And of course, we can't. We don't, most of us have that power. I'm not Ron DeSantis. You're not Joe Biden. You know, we can't uh, wave our magic wand and perform these vast transformations of, of history. And so we need some sort of set of answers that's going to return us to agency and authority Already over our human-sized lives and problems. Um, and so that's why the first step is log off. Uh, that is to say, uh, address the problems that are facing you in real time and space. Um, it, it problems in your neighborhood, problems to do with you know how you're going to run your school board. Uh, before we started recording, we were talking about Nashville, where I live, and all the kind of particular site-specific answers that we've come up with here to issues that have a national valence, such as you know what's going to be taught in our schools. You know, that's something that you're able to actually address with your neighbor face to face much better than by screaming at one another on Twitter. And, and I say go to church then because these things do have a spiritual dimension. Um, I'm not going to, you know, proselytize for one sect and bang the drum and say that everybody ought to belong to my church, although I think that would be great. Um, I just think that people need some sense of purpose and direction uh, that goes beyond the material world, because uh, otherwise you are going to end up kind of enslaved to these political narratives um, fighting with one another over just like these massive uh, chaotic apocalyptic uh, stories about what's happening between the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, when when really, I think our solution is rooted in something that the ancient Greeks uh, would have called philia, uh, and indeed politike philia, which translates roughly to something like civic friendship or even political love. Um, these are the sorts of things that you can only do in relationship with one another. And it actually starts um, around the table. It starts in homes and in neighborhoods, um, which is good news because it means that, in fact, the small choices that you make at a local level uh, are going to have the kind of cosmic significance uh, that you yearn for when you dream about, you know, writing the big law or, you know, getting the right presidential election or what have you. Um, but it actually begins in a, in a face to face way. And there's no there's no escaping that there's no kind of up uploading or offloading this into the cloud. Um, what, what we really need, I think, is a return to embodied face to face problems uh, and engagement with those problems. Yes, Spencer, I, I'm glad you brought that up because back in the day uh, when I was in politics, I had friends who were Democrats. My friends married each other, Democrats mm -hmm. and uh, Republicans, liberals and conservatives. We partied together. So why have we suddenly become so partisan? Well, I mean, this may be one of those things that's sort of like, how did you go bankrupt, right? Very slowly and then all at once. Um, and our mutual friend, my uh, colleague, boss editor, Charles Kessler, uh, you know, writes very eloquently about what's, what's called the crisis of the two constitutions. And in general, at, at Claremont, where, where I work, you know, we spend a lot of attention on the sort of underlying set of assumptions that were brewing throughout really the second half of the 20th century um, that led us to a place where we became mutually unintelligible to one another. I definitely think that's that's part of it. But as you say, I mean, America had a very healthy culture of engagement across difference and, and across disagreement for a long time. Um, and it had to do with a set, I think, of shared assumptions that even if we disagreed about what tax policy ought to be, or we would duke it out on the Senate floor, you know, we still fundamentally sort of agreed that this thing called, you know, the, the American Republic had a lot of good things going for it. Um, and we wanted it to succeed. We just didn't agree necessarily on how to get 
get there. Now we have a situation where there is a significant narrative, an argument out there that, in fact, the American Republic shouldn't succeed. It's better if it doesn't because it's founded on racism and evil. Um, it's historically embedded in all sorts of injustice, and it would probably be a boon to the world if it were overthrown altogether. And so in the book, the first thing that I do is just argue strenuously against that proposition, that, that in fact, not only is America founded on sound ideals um, and and well-articulated beliefs that come to us from a long tradition of, of political philosophy in the West, um, it also is represents sort of the best flowering of those ideals to date. And just because those ideals didn't fall perfectly out of the sky uh, and weren't embodied at every time and place in their highest and best form, well, you know, I, I have news. <laughs> they never are going to be embodied perfectly because neither you nor I nor anybody can live up to um, perfection, to the ideals that that we've sort of found over time through strenuous argumentation and, and discussion. Um, and so it, it's, fool, it's foolishness, I argue in the book, to sort of toss out um, America as a concept, as an endeavor, as a project. But that does leave us with this question, well, you know, how many people are there really out there willing to come together and discuss and debate how to do America well rather than overthrow her altogether. And, and my suspicion is, and this has been confirmed just in my personal life through, you know, engagement with, with my neighbors and talking offline to people in, in the real world. My suspicion is that there's a lot more folks that actually do want basically to live well in America um, and to live American lives than the news would have you believe. And that's because we have an extremely powerful oligarchy, an oligarchic elite broadcasting constantly the uh, a set of assumptions that would justify overthrowing America altogether and, and, and trying as hard as possible to make us understand one another in these kind of online absolutist terms, because it works well if we're at each other's throats for them to seize power, for the Biden administration, let's say, to characterize all the unvaccinated as tantamount to a disease, right? Um, the more we accept those sorts of narratives, the easier it is for us to be controlled. Instead, if you actually, as I've sort of been suggesting, if you actually go out into the world and attend your school board meeting, do some of the stuff that we've seen going on in red cities like Florida, states like Florida and cities like Miami, you know, what you'll find is that capital D Democrat, capital R Republican, that's not actually a type of, of person. And the diversity of thought in the states, even still, even now, is much, much larger than our categories would give us to believe. So this is one reason why I think it's so essential to be having these conversations in uh, in physical space, in, in real space time. Um, because in face-to-face -face encounter, we, we discover we have a lot more uh, to work toward on specific issues than our kind of online narratives would would have us believe. I think the digital culture and the rise of this kind of neo-Marxist vanguard um, has convinced us that we are enemies when in fact there's still potential there for us to be friends. <clears throat> Following up on that, you know, it, it, it seems like, I don't know, for many people they might have, have seen overnight all of a sudden you have this woke explosion and people are having to encounter these sort of odd questions that people may not have thought about before or really just kind of things that people we might all agree or the lunatic fringe would bring up from from time to time maybe you could give us a little a little history lesson you know where does all of this modern wokeness come from yeah, well, in the book, I really identify a lot of these strains of thought with what you might call cultural Marxism or the new left. I mean, you can give it a bunch of different names. And there's recently been a lot of, you know, infighting and outfighting online about how to define the word woke at all. And can conservatives define this word or is it just a kind of political cudgel, a buzzword that nobody really knows what it means? It just means people I don't like. And one thing I do in the book is I argue that, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, it is true that, you know, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, Marxism in America, influenced in, in large part by continental philosophers like, you know, Antonio Gramsci, for instance, um, Marxism took a turn in, in a cultural direction um, and began rather than sort of dividing up or understanding politics according to economic classes and um, actively proposed that Americans understand 
understand one another in these sort of identitarian demographic categories. And this is where we get terms like white privilege, right? That sort of Noel Ignatiev is, is one name you'll hear tossed around a lot here, this kind of white skin privilege idea that the workers in America are insufficiently radicalized because they have yet to take account for the fact that as white people inherently, um, they are oppressors. Um, and that logic, that template of argumentation was then kind of infinitely repurposed for every new aggrieved group for the LGBTQIA plus for, you know, various different racial categories. Um, and so this wokeness, which was you know, installed uh, in, in one form or another through the academy, through the positions of intellectual power, and has worked its way year after year through our uh, positions and, and uh, institutions of higher learning. And so now that it's spilling out onto the streets, on the one hand, yeah, very easy to say, where did all of this come from? On the other, it's pretty easy to answer that question. I mean, it comes from a, a strenuous, dedicated effort to persuade people that facial arguments that get made about America, about who we are and what we want as a country. Um, these are all kind of window dressing. These are all lies designed to disguise the fact that really Marx was right all along. It's all about labor, power and oppression, domination. Um, and so I, I would argue that that's where it comes from. It comes from a very dedicated effort on the part of the new left cultural Marxists to uh, turn us against one another along precisely the lines that we are now fighting over, these identitarian lines that boil people down to identity categories. Um, these are This is not an accident. It's not a mistake. And the right, I think, in order to respond, needs to understand that it's making the counterclaim. It's actually affirming American ideals and the American constitution, big C and small c, as accurately, honestly, and well conceived. The more robust we are about that, I think, the better. Is there hope for the academy? Hmm. Uh, absolutely. But I don't think it's going to look like the academy of yesteryear. So there are, I fear, at least there are institutions which are now irreparably compromised and captured. Um, and a lot of the Ivy Leagues, I'd say with some sorrow as a graduate of one, you know, a lot of the Ivy Leagues look to me as if the leadership of those institutions have simply plunked for a kind of anti-intellectual and anti-American set of ideologies. Now, never say never. I certainly hope that, that I'll be proven wrong about this, but it seems more and more the case that this is kind of a done deal in, in some of our once great institutions of, of higher learning. Having said all of that, it's also the case that there is a good thing that's come out of digital technology, as well as all these problems we've been discussing. And that is that those institutions of higher learning no longer have a monopoly on intellectual excellence, on access to voluminous sort of research archives and, and libraries. I mean, you and I can be here having this conversation. I can go and do, I think, pretty high level research without ever leaving my room. And this has produced an enormous flowering of intellectual activity in America, I, at, around the world, but specifically in the States, I see these incredible institutions. I mean, just to name a couple that always come to mind, one is the Ancient Language Institute, and that's since it's in my field, I, I know it. You know, these these guys teach the classical languages at every level from the sort of beginner to the advanced. And they do it through direct engagement with primary sources, classical texts. You're reading Virgil instantly, you know, when you start working with them if you're doing Latin uh, or you're reading the Bible if you're doing Hebrew. You know, that sort of thing, which would have been impossible even 20 years ago, now has the capacity to form a real counter academy. I mean, the classic learning test is another example of kind of alternative uh, to the SAT that uses the Western canon and classical sources to invite kids into a rubric where they can really genuinely become educated. And I see this stuff taking root more and more. I think it's unfortunately going to be a race between, you know, whether the academy can corrupt us faster than this new thing can take shape. But whatever else happens, ultimately, I think the kind of new flowering of American intellect, which is happening online, which is happening in these kind of different and innovative ways and, uh, and, and in these 
institutions that we wouldn't have thought about a few years ago. That's really hopeful to me. I think I think there is real hope for us, a serious academic revival in this country, but it's going to look different than it ever has. Following up on that, you know, we've had a, a big debate over rising college debt and the rising costs of college in recent um, months and years, both in California and nationally. We had the Biden proposal on canceling student debt. And, you know, there's all sorts of debates over how do we ensure that America is producing the trained workforce to meet the demands of not only employers, but to achieve in the global economy. So kind of begs a really a more philosophical question. Should kids who want to good, get a good education still go to college? Mm-hmm. And, you know, what, what's really the best way for them to prepare, not only to kind of grapple the issues that we're talking about and be good citizens, but, you know, to be prepared for whatever they want to do in life? Right. Well, this is a great example of one of those kind of rubber meets the road questions where highfalutin intellectual concerns boil down to a choice that every individual is going to have to make or every family is going to have to make for their kids. And I get confronted with this choice a lot. People write into me about this very thing. What should I do with my you know, bright young thing, you know, boy or girl who's about to go off into the world. And I don't want them to simply be snatched out of my hands into this corrosive ideology. And yet I want them to succeed in life. I want them to have every advantage and benefit. And I fear that if we simply silo ourselves off from these credentialing institutions, then this kid of mine is going to end up basically in, you know, with, with the doors shut in his face. And I think that this is at at the point where where we are currently, I think that this may be kind of an individual case by case question. And there are some people for whom it's it remains, I think, useful to seek out a degree at one of the sort of big name colleges or universities. Uh, but I think the first question is, as with anything, what's your intention? What's your purpose? Where do you want to sort of see your life heading? Um, this is what an Aristotelian would call the telos, right? What's the point of your education and indeed of your career more generally? And I think we definitely need to recover a sense that the answer to that question for many, many people and for more and more people is going to be, well, I, I want to learn this specific trade. And in order to do that, I'm actually better served by a, a steady diet of YouTube videos videos throughout the end of high school and perhaps an apprenticeship, which then leads me on into a, you know, a job when I would otherwise be you know, spending four years in college. I do have friends and family for whom that has been the best course of action. But the second thing that I would add that's a really crucial component of this is it's not quite enough just to say, well, this is what I want to do with my life. So I'm just going to focus in on that. And I think we also need to recover very profoundly the sense of a liberal arts education for for everybody uh, based on the kind of classical and, and medieval idea of the quadrivium and the trivium, these basic uh, fundamental disciplines that everybody should be trained in in order to think well. And and again, you know, it's possible to get that kind of education outside of the traditional sort of credentialing circuit. Um, The institutions that I just mentioned are great ways to start thinking about this. You know, homeschooling is another route that has been really great for a lot of people. Um, But I think those two things are really the core of what people should be looking for. They should be looking for uh, something that's going to stand them well in their chosen profession and a broad base liberal arts education. Um, it's possible to get those still in the academy. There are places, for instance, like Hillsdale that are doing a beautiful job of offering it. Um, but it's also possible to get them in non-traditional means, especially if what you want is to learn a trade, which we ought to honor and, and value as a really legitimate approach to life. So the the pandemic has ended, but but its effects are, are still with us. What did the coronavirus reveal about the, the state of our politics and our philosophy? I think that the coronavirus response more than the virus itself and leaving aside questions of its origins and so forth. I think the response to the coronavirus was a pretty, it was was really a kind of a mask off moment for many of our so-called self-styled elites, that there were many things such as seizing control of state, local and federal power to shut people in their homes, which seemed totally unconscionable to us. 
but had been kind of natural consequences of the capital P progressive project for a long time. I think one thing coronavirus revealed is that the sort of Woodrow Wilson progressive idea that government is simply a machine and human beings are parts in the machine and it's the enlightened kind of leader or even despot who needs to work the machine and nudge people and things around until you optimize outcomes. Um, that whole kind of mathematical equation idea about government had really taken root in our centers of power to an extent that ordinary Americans didn't realize. And so when people like Dr. Fauci came out and said, you know, I am the science, I represent the science. And for that reason, I get to declare what the number is that we need to get vaccinated and, we, and we're ready to sort of hedge and bend the truth in order to, you know, get people to do what we want rather than let them make their own decisions. And that sounded like a totally crazy, out of left field, bonkers thing for him to say. But really, it was a natural consequence of a certain managerial bureaucratic way of thinking about government and humanity and the soul and, 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 and indeed morality. So I think what one thing that COVID did for a lot of people is it revealed clearly the stakes and the nature of the conflicts that we're having over how we're going to do life in America. And, and because I remain an optimist, I insist that most people still don't want to live that way. But we certainly saw during COVID how many of our supposed leaders and supposed best and brightest do indeed want to live that way and want power power to make even the most minute decisions about how we run our lives. So as we near the end of our discussion, maybe um, we end on kind of a deep note here. You know, with all that we see kind of going around the world, especially in our foreign policy today, we see the the rise of China, certainly, and a more aggressive China on the, the global stage. It makes one think, you know, will Western ideas I, even matter down the road if China dominates or, God forbid, if America falls. Right. Well, one thing, one way of approaching this question is to ask, are you a pessimist or an optimist, right? Do you think that uh, things are going to go well or things are going to go badly? But one thing I've learned over the course of the last few years and writing this book and introducing it to the world um, is, you know, I get asked that question a lot. And I, I've realized that it's actually not very fruitful to argue with one another about pessimism and optimism, because it turns out they're both predictions about the future. Optimism is a prediction that things will go well. Pessimism is a prediction that things will go badly. And the truth of the matter is that neither you nor I actually knows what's going to happen. We can read the tea leaves, we can make predictions, um, but because humanity remains free, because free will is, is a real thing, and because the world is not actually a giant mathematical equation, um, we genuinely don't know what's going to happen, which is good news and bad news, because good things might happen, bad things might happen. The real question remains, where is your hope? That's, I think, a better way to approach these sorts of issues and to say, what is the thing that we might hope for? And, and what's the job that we have to do today or tomorrow to advance toward that hope? And my hope is that even if things go terribly wrong, effort spent in defense of Western ideals and in defense of the Western canon will never be in vain simply because truths which really are eternal, and I believe that's what the canon delivers, it, it never ultimately get extinguished. They don't vanish. They simply can be obscured for a time. And let's say that the worst happens, God forbid, America falls, China rules the world. Um, it will remain the case that human nature hasn't been extinguished or destroyed. Um, it will remain the case that there are such things as absolute truths and that the human mind can know them. And however desperately we may need to cling in the darkness to those realities, um, the canon and the history of the West will always be our, one of our best guides to Toward preserving those truths, even if we have to do so in, in dire circumstances. We don't know what will come. Things could go a lot better than we're talking about right now. But even if things go poorly, the question will still remain, where is our hope? And the answer will have to be, I think, in that light of tradition and wisdom that we carry forward daily in our small and large actions, whatever else may come. Well, we, we hope to end in a joyful note, Spencer. Sure. So for our favorite question, we call our 
ourselves next round because we love to enjoy a glass of wine as we discuss politics and public policy these days. What are you enjoying to, to celebrate the, the launch of your book? Well, you are out in California, so you have an abundance of riches to choose from when it comes to good wineries. But I want to let you know and your listeners know about one that you may or may not have yet discovered. It's called Story of Soil, and they have a tasting room out in Los Olivos. So if you ever make your way there, you can drop in and try their wines. Um, They're not paying me to say this, I swear. I just love them. They're called Story of Soil because they intervene very little in the maturation process. And so you can really taste a lot of that kind of earthy flavor, which I really like in a wine. And I'm going to say that their Gamay is the one you should check out, especially if maybe the earthiness doesn't sound like you want to dive right right into all of that intensity. Their game is light and yet still has a real kind of hint of the earth in it. That's the only way I can uh, put it. And I just love them. So Story of Soil Game is what I would endorse. Thank you so much, Spencer. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.